Good morning. Thank you so much, uh, Jeffrey, for that very kind introduction. I was last here in Toronto in 1982 when I was 11 years old. My grandparents would summer in Bob Cajun. How many of you have heard of Bob Cajun? There's a famous song now about Bob Cajun. And that was a very happy uh, memory for me um, 37 years ago to, to come up here and see the CN Tower. And I was very happy to see again last night that it's still very tall. Um, so Madam Vice President Roberto, thank you very much for all you do to help women and serve as an inspiration uh, for all of us here today. It's an honor to be in your presence. I had the pleasure of visiting uh, your country a few years ago on vacation, including in Quezon City, and I look forward, hopefully, to coming back uh, now as the head of the Export-Import Bank of the United States. I'm happy to be with all of you uh, exactly four months since I was sworn in as President and Chairman of the Export-Import Bank of the United States. This is actually my ninth trip and fourth international trip on behalf of Exim since starting the job. As Jeffrey mentioned, uh, I was uh, sworn in on May 9th and uh, immediately went to China to meet with my G12 counterparts uh, that focus on export credit agency financing. We had a very important discussion on the future of export credit financing. And then I headed to South Africa where I represented the United States at the swearing in of President Ramaphosa. And it was an honor to be on stage with uh, world leaders, particularly those from Sub-Saharan Africa. I then went to Germany where I attended a conference and spoke and met with the leading financial institutions in our world who focus on export credit financing. How many of you in the audience today are bankers? Okay, we have a few. So I did 20 back-to-backs in 30-minute increments with, with the leading financial institutions to let them know that the United States Export-Import Bank is now uh, reopened and uh, ready to do lots of business to support Made in USA being exported all around the world. Helping me with that here today, I would like to recognize my colleague, Luke Lindbergh, a great, uh, a great leader at XM, and he's going to remain here for uh, today and tomorrow, so uh, I invite you to talk with him after I uh, must leave. Um, I also look forward to talking with my ca Canadian counterpart, and I don't know if she's in the room right now, May Reed uh, Lavery, uh, President and CEO of Export Development Canada. Is May Reed in the audience? I know we're gonna meet in a little bit. Um, Canada was the one nation not in attendance at the G12 in China that I just mentioned. Um, and so I've been really looking forward to getting to, to, to know her and I look forward to welcoming her to the United States because we will be hosting the G12 there next spring. I also want to congratulate uh, Mr. Dominic Barton, as was mentioned. Um, I actually have a meeting immediately after uh, my presentation here with him. And uh, that was said in advance, but how wonderful that he was named uh, yesterday as uh, Canada's uh, new ambassador to China. And I know that uh, Ambassador Branstead uh, looks forward to welcoming um, him in Beijing. As many of you know, our Export-Import Bank was not fully functioning for about four years because the agency lacked a quorum of its board of directors. And so I am now, uh, I was confirmed by the Senate along with two others, so we are now reopened. And it's because President Trump delivered uh, this victory for the American people. That's why I especially like the theme of this conference, leading the new economy. In May, I was fortunate enough to have a ceremonial swearing in in the Oval Office. And while I was there, the President told me to do great things and to lead this institution to new heights so that the world will see more products stamped with those four beautiful words made in the USA. And that's what I intend to do and I'm working uh, very hard along with almost 400 uh, exceptional colleagues at the Export-Import Bank. 
I am fully committed to doing great things on behalf of United States great manufacturers, service providers, and workers. The President understands how the mission of Exim supports his agenda of creating jobs and bringing manufacturing back to the USA. In the past 10 years, the agency has supported more than 1 million private sector American jobs. As you might imagine, Exim has a pipeline of current applications that need board consideration, given that we were hindered for about four years because we were not confirmed by the Senate. Because of that, we now have more than $40 billion in transactions that would support nearly a quarter million good U.S. jobs. And I know that many of those applications likely focus on infrastructure. The plan is for us to work through these applications at a thoughtful, reasonable, and responsible pace. We want to make our way through this pipeline, protecting the interests of the U.S. taxpayer. It will be paramount as we do this. The fact that the agency has a default rate of one half of one percent shows the prudence of XM staff. And for the bankers in the room, I think they would agree that default rate of uh, one half of one percent is very, very good. And we want to keep doing good deals to help our great businesses on behalf of the American people. This morning's plenary session is entitled The Next Generation of Infrastructure. As we all know, infrastructure is a strategic issue. Right after I was confirmed, I had the pleasure of participating in a Center for Strategic and International Studies discussion on its Global Infrastructure Task Force initiative called The Higher Road, Foraging a U.S. Strategy for the Global Infrastructure Challenge. One of the project's directors, Daniel Rundy, now serves as chairman of our Exim Sub-Saharan Africa Advisory Committee and will lead our advisory committee in its first meeting on September 11th at Exim headquarters in Washington. The task force recommended seven elements as part of its recommended framework for U.S. policymakers. One, articulate a global vision. Two, work with allies and partners. Three, elevate and lead the digital domain. Four, power the world toward a sustainable future. Five, catalyzing private sector financing. Six, build partner capacity. And seven, bolster U.S. government expertise and coordination. Following up on some of these recommendations, I sat down with my colleague from the U.S. Treasury Department, Acting Assistant Secretary for International Markets and Development, Mitchell Silk, at Exim yesterday, right, where we talked about catalyzing private sector capital. The share of infrastructure commitments with private participation in the developing world that received multilateral or bilateral support went from 15% in 2013 to over 50% in 2017. No doubt, no doubt this has helped get projects done. We need to continue to work with countries to find the right combination of incentives with the goal not just of building infrastructure, but eliminating the need for official sector slash public support. Now I'd like to turn uh, back to uh, what I'm working on at XM. As President Trump has said, it's time to rebuild our country and bring back our jobs to restore our dreams. And as long as there's a nexus with exporting, Exim can help. One of the ways we can help the American people and assist the President in delivering on his agenda is through facilitating the expansion of U.S. exports through domestic infrastructure projects. Exim has a great deal of experiencing in, uh, experience in financing infrastructure projects, would have, which have helped improve the lives of millions, millions of people, not only in the United States, but around the world. These projects have touched all corners of the globe, including Sub-Saharan Africa, which, ex which Exim has a con congressional mandate to serve, like the hospital we financed in Ghana, bridges in Zambia, and a water treatment facility in Cameroon. The hospital in Ghana is the primary hospital in Accra and is among the most advanced medical facilities in West Africa. The sale of modular steel bridges to Zambia, made with pride in Pennsylvania, not only helped make the country more accessible, but also supported hundreds of American jobs. 
in the potable water treatment facility project in Cameroon helped alleviate a severe clean water shortage impacting the capital city of Yaoundé. These projects positively impacted millions of people while also supporting thousands of good jobs at home, a win-win. But we can also support projects at home that will foster the expansion of exports. Projects like port expansions, Jeffrey, railway development, and LNG bunkering. Two weeks ago, I sat down with the leading organizations focused on domestic LNG in the United States, and we had a really good discussion about what needed to be done to help that industry uh, be able to export. Projects like these will become increasingly more important as global competition in terms of trade has never been more intense. To improve American infrastructure, federal, state, and local governments must work together with private industry to improve our airports, seaports, and waterways, roads and railways, transit systems, and telecommunication. President Trump has been crystal clear about his desire to improve American competitiveness through the improvement of our domestic infrastructure. In particular, the President's recent executive order promotes energy infrastructure and economic growth through the development of a new energy infrastructure. This will make energy more affordable for the Americas, for Americans, while safeguarding the environment and enhancing our nation's economic and geopolitical advantages. The United States is blessed with an abundant supply of energy, and to fully realize this economic potential, the country needs infrastructure capable of safely and efficiently transporting these resources to end users. I'd like to now briefly turn to national security. The President has also said that national security is economic security. Economic security equals national security. We must promote free, fair, and reciprocal economic relationships. We must meet the challenge and provide Americans new opportunities to increase their exports. And the United States must expand trade that is fairer so U.S. workers and industries have more opportunities to compete for business. By strengthening the international trading system and incentivizing other countries to embrace market-friendly policies, we can enhance our prosperity. The United States will incentivize private sector growth. We will expand U.S. trade and investment opportunities and increase the market base for U.S. goods and services. The President knows that restoring Exim is important in protecting U.S. strategic interests around the world. It's a tool in the economic and strategic toolbox at a time when global competition has never been more intense. There are now more than 100 export credit agencies, or ECAs, in operation around the world, a significant increase in recent years. And I mentioned I look forward to meeting the head of Canada's ECA uh, in a few hours. Many in this room are well, aware, are well aware ECAs are now being used by many countries as instruments to achieve strategic policy objectives. They're not just about supporting exports anymore. Competitor ECAs have been working hard to lure projects home for their own companies and have been picking off parts of the U.S. supply chain and their associated jobs through offering export financing. When this production shifts abroad, American jobs are lost, not only at larger manufacturers, but also in the hundreds of small businesses that supply parts and components to the bigger guys. Exim financing for large U.S. exporters has significant positive effects on small businesses that are part of the U.S. supply chain. For example, in 2015, one large business had 15,000 suppliers. Of those, 6,000 were small businesses. Last year, Exim approved more than $2 billion of small business authorization, and more than 90% of Exim's transactions directly support small business. And it's not just small businesses that Exim helps support, but also, Madam Vice President, minority and women-owned businesses. In 2017 and 2018, Exim authorized nearly $1 billion to support minority and women-owned businesses. And over the past 10 years, the agency has also supported export from these businesses to more than 160 countries. 
Exim has a robust and active team of specialists dedicated to helping these businesses export with confidence. Let's now turn to China. When it comes to export credit financing, China is the most aggressive on this front. China uses export financing to reach its goals of achieving market dominance in high-tech industries currently dominated by the United States. These industries include robotics, telecommunications, aircraft, and renewable energy. The Chinese have supported more, than, more exports in the last two years than the United States Export-Import Bank has in its entire 85-year existence. To find evidence of this fundamental shift in the use of export credit, you need to look no further than our annual competitiveness report, which was released in June. The report finds that over the last 10 to 15 years, China's export credit system has caused the ECAs of other governments to change the way they do business or risk their exporters losing access to large swaths of key markets. Chinese export finance and investment activity has quadrupled from about one-tenth of G7 activity in 2008 to a level equaling the G7 in 2018. China provided more trade-related support in 2018 than the next three largest countries combined, South Korea, Japan, I'm sorry, South Korea, Germany, and Italy. The restoration of Exim's Borg Quorum means that the agency is available to U.S. industry to work as a counterweight to the actions of China. We also do co-financing projects with other ECAs. And again, that's why I look forward to meeting uh, the head of uh, Canada's ECA in a few hours. This is good news. But we still have another hurdle uh, to clear this year so that Exim can continue to help uh, the president in his effort. And that is because our agency's charter expires this fall, meaning that Exim needs to be authorized by the United States Congress. We know how important it is for the next reauthorization to provide private industry certainty in the marketplace and the timeline needed for planning the allocation of capital. I'm already engaged with leaders in both the U.S. House and Senate on reauthorizing Exim and in making the agency even better by implementing positive reforms to increase transparency and effectiveness. So there's much work to do, and I'm excited for the many great things that are ahead, including when it comes to domestic and international infrastructure. Again, I'm so pleased to be here today and to continue fostering our global relationships. Canada is rated number one in the category of least risk for Exim financial support. Canada and Mexico are the United States' two top trading export markets, among other great countries that may also be present in this forum, which has 3,300 registrants. I look forward to coming back again and sharing more good news with you in the future. President Trump wants to see Exim produ produce for our businesses, and I am committed to making this a reality. I look forward to working with you in order to do great things on behalf of American workers and the U.S. economy and global prosperity around the world. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And I'd also like to thank the Toronto Global Forum for allowing us to have this important dialogue today. Um, infrastructure has truly been a story of evolution as it is responding to merging needs. These needs have been driven by urbanization and technology. And if we think about a few very important data points that we probably don't think about on a daily basis, I just want to share it with the folks around the table and in this audience. Um, half of the world currently live in, half of the world currently live in cities and generate over 80% of the global GDP. If we look out 10 years and think about the requirements on infrastructure, it will represent over 3.5% of the global GDP. And then if we look out even further, by 2050, and you think about infrastructure requirements as they're forecasted out until 2050, and where we are today, we'll see that there's a deficit of over 75% of the required infrastructure that needs to actually be um, developed over time. So with these staggering numbers, I feel I'm 
privilege to be sitting with a group of distinguished panelists where we can share some thoughts and discussions to talk about the next generation of infrastructure as required for us, not only for today in terms of meeting today's communities and our livelihoods and well-being, but also the sustainability of the infrastructure that we create today that will have an impact and will be able to be brought forward for generations to come. So in terms of a brief introduction, I'd like to just quickly introduce my panelists and then afterwards we'll go into a Q&A session for about um, 45 minutes or so. Um, so first of all, to my immediate left, we have Mr. Tipsu Munshi, who is the Minister of Commerce for Bangladesh. Bangladesh is one of the fastest growing economies in the world and I'm honored to have um, a, a, a prestigious public figure to talk about infrastructure as it relates to a government context. Next to Minister Munshi, we have Mr. Mike Renchek, who is the CEO of Bruce Power. Bruce Power was the first and largest nuclear power, um, private nuclear power generator uh, in Canada, and he, they're also engaged in the largest infrastructure project in Canada. And finally, to his left is Mr. Salim Bora, who is the CEO of SUMA, an uh, internationally recognized construction company that uh, manages significant projects ranging from infrastructure, aviation, to transportation and energy. So first of all, Mr. Munshi, I'd like to ask you an opening question, and that is, how is infrastructure investment during your, how is infrastructure investment driving your country's economic and social development? <clears throat> Thank you, and good morning. Well, you know our country is a developing country, and um, by the year 2024, we are going to be graduated from there. So all through in our country, now the infrastructure is now taking a new shape. And we know, you know that our third world country, we have a lot of problem about for this electric generation. We have problem with infrastructure, road, and other things. So now our government, this government is uh, working hard to develop that side. Uh, one of the breeze in our country, which is called Padda breeze, almost we are uh, spending more than $4 billion for that. And besides that, the road and other infrastructure are coming up. Uh, uh, our digital, we are making our country very digital and uh, almost all, everybody, the new age people are now uh, habituated to the digital uh, communication and other things. And we have the railway communication also. The infrastructure is coming up very big way because very developing country and most of the, lot of people are staying in the cities. So infrastructure position in Bangladesh is quite now uh, uh, significant. So what I feel that the infrastructure now taking shape in Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you very much. If we move on to Mike, you're currently developing the largest infrastructure project in Canada. Could you tell us more about the goals of the project and what it means for Canada as you're building it out and over the longer term, please? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right. Yes, we, uh, we're in the process of renewing uh, our reactor fleet at Bruce Power. We have eight operating nuclear reactors here in Ontario, about three hours uh, northwest of Toronto on Lake Huron. And we're in a very rural area. Like one of our largest towns in the vicinity is about 14,000 people. So when you think about that, we employ about 4,000 full-time people at the site and about another 1,500 uh, folks that come in through contractors. So we are a major employer for that whole region of the uh, province. What we do, though, more importantly, is part of this infrastructure investment in development is we've enabled the phase out of coal generation here in Ontario. Uh, we brought four reactors into service between 2003 and 2015, and that corresponded with the phase out of coal generation. What that means is that CO2-free uh, energy is available, it's affordable, and it's reliable here in Ontario. To give you an example, in Germany, the carbon intensity per kilowatt hour of electricity is 500 grams. In California, it's about 245 grams on an annual basis. 
And here in Ontario, we are at 46 grams. So we've deeply decarbonized our, our generation. And now the transportation sector is the next sector that, that looks uh, for decarbonization as well as the industrials. But in doing that, we also had to keep track of the affordability of our price. By bringing nuclear into play uh, broadly and sustaining that, if you look at what the Ontario Energy Board says, uh, the price of generation for hydro generation is about six cents per kilowatt hour. Nuclear is about seven and a half cents per kilowatt hour. Wind generation is about 16 cents a kilowatt hour. Gas generation about 20 cents a kilowatt hour. And solar generation is about 51 cents per kilowatt hour. So we are a low cost producer and enabling Ontario's economy to prosper. But we don't just stop there. With the infrastructure investment, we are developing the economy throughout Ontario and in our region. As an example, our investments uh, will start in 2016 and run through 2033. So we are enabling a long-term view in terms of how companies can participate, how communities can participate over time from an economic perspective. That's resulting in 22,000 direct and indirect jobs and about $4 billion each year into Ontario's economy. More importantly, for rural Ontario in the three counties near us, we have towns, uh, the largest town that you say is about 14,000 people. They have roughly $60 million worth of building permits in process. Three counties have created upwards of 300 small businesses in the last two years, and about 10,000 housing units are under construction. So it's having an effect not only in the vicinity of our facility, but more broadly. And it's also enabling us to continue our advancements in the production of medical isotopes. You may or may not know, but Canada is a leading world supplier of COBOL-60. And at Bruce Power, we're a leading supplier of that COBOL-60. We supply 40%, uh, we supply COBOL that sterilizes 40% of the once-use medical equipment around the world. So there's a high probability if you went to the doctor or the dentist over the last year, the equipment that was used on you was sterilized by an isotope made right here in Ontario. We are also uh, moving into brain tumor treatments. Uh, breast cancer treatments, and we've just announced today the introduction of some new breast cancer treatment technologies, and we'll be moving into uh, prostate cancer treatments. So as we, as we look at the long-term sustainability of our infrastructure investments, we're not just looking at economic prosperity, we're looking at inclusion, and we're working very closely with the Saugeen and Ojibwe Nation on the advancement of our isotope businesses. This will have a lasting effect, not only in rural Ontario, but for all Ontarians that will enjoy the clean, CO2-free, reliable, and affordable electricity for many decades to come. Thank you for that. And over to you, Salim. Your company delivers large, complex, civil construction projects on a global basis. Can you tell us a bit about the challenges and opportunities that that you face in the markets in which you operate? Sure, thank you everyone and thanks for inviting me to this wonderful panel. Um, we have been working for the last 30 years in uh, international construction markets and um, the biggest challenge we are facing because we are working in emerging markets is uh, to reach the financing. International global financing is the number one issue uh, when you try to implement certain projects. The governments, unfortunately, have certain uh, limitations on borrowings, which is um, often time, uh, times controlled by IMF, and uh, that's why uh, even if you bring the financing, are they capable to borrow? So usually this is the main uh, issue in those emerging markets. But there's a paradox uh, in the whole system uh, that I have to mention. Like uh, my colleague was saying, Cobalt 60 is one of the, uh, their best-selling items. One of the best-selling items of the poorest country in the world, like Niger, is uranium. They have, they have three main resources, gold, uranium, 
and oil, yet they are the poorest country in the world. Why is this like that? Aren't we supposed to ask this question to ourselves? Uh, why it's happening this way? And why 22 million population nation with all these resources are facing poverty? There's a big dilemma here. A tiny company like Summa, this is a family-owned company, we managed to invest 200 million euros last year in Niger, building the Niamey International Airport and a five-star Radisson Blue Hotel. The one and only, the first five-star hotel in the country. You should see the uh, hope in people's eye. You know, they have the first five-star hotel. They have now a decent airport. People can uh, enjoy the terminal building and buy items from duty-free. And come on, we are in 21st century. We are talking on one side $300 billion funds uh, to be mobilized around the globe, yet we cannot contribute enough to develop those countries in an efficient manner. So 70% of, I believe, France electricity comes from nuclear power plant. Is it true? I don't know. You're an expert, most probably. And most of the uranium they are taking, uh, uh, the uh, source is Niger. And yet, you know, uh, people are not paying enough attention to those countries. And then we all ask ourselves why the problems are created, you know, why there is instability. Niger is in the middle of uh, Africa, as you know, in the, uh, in the map. And did you know that it's the most crucial corridor for the refugees going to Europe through Niger, Libya, then Italy, and they are in Europe. The uh, German government announced a program called Marshall Plan. Marshall Plan's uh, idea was to create jobs and create a eco micro economy, in, especially in Niger, to avoid the traveling of these uh, people from uh, south to north, which creates a huge problem in Europe. And this refugee, refugee movement uh, is a big problem for everybody. Turkey today is, uh, has about 4 million Syrians living in Turkey. Why? Because there's inst instability in Syria. So you have to accommodate them, you have to create infrastructure for them. And the reason why I am so excited about working in those emerging countries, you bring a solid infrastructure uh, support which creates jobs today. Niamey International Airport that we built is a tiny airport, but it has about 400 uh, employees. The Radisson Blue Hotel has about 250 employees, and they are feeding their families. And 99% are the local people. So the importance of infrastructure is there. Everybody knows about it. But how about the efficiency? You bring to a project to U.S. Exim Bank, Turkish Exim Bank, I don't know, European uh, Exim uh, organizations, it takes so many months for them to consider a file. Forget about, you know, deploying the money. Uh, to comply with the documentation, uh, all the procedures, etc. by the time you fulfill these uh, procedures, either the governments change, either the, you know, uh, other problems occur, so our common enemy, I believe, is time. We have to fight with this efficiency. And I was happy to uh, hear from Madame Reed, uh, the chairman of Exim Bank, that they are trying to make this change. So hopefully, uh, fastest growing economies and there are slow growing economies. So we have to make a decision whom to support the most. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. I'm going to actually pick up on a couple of those points, a couple of those themes. One of them is financing. And when we think about financing, there's several models that can be used either from a, a public perspective or from a private perspective. And there's several models that have been introduced that work to various levels of success, from public privatizations to 
levels of control through regulatory uh, involvement uh, as it relates to financing to pure private sector financing. But I'd like to ask each of you, perhaps, Salim, right back to you since you, you, you began this discussion on financing as, as potentially one of the challenges. Is how, how do you think about the public and private sectors in terms of how they can work together in terms of develop, uh, delivering on the financial requirements for projects? Now, we all know that the uh, emerging markets governments have problem with their uh, budget and uh, the taking loans uh, appropriately. That's why the private sector has a big role in um, fixing this problem. Uh, the only way I see is the BOT and PPP schemes. We have to be m more uh, concentrated uh, on those schemes, especially uh, in energy generation, transportation, health sector. I mean, a toll road example I always look at interestingly in Senegal. The French company AFAS has invested 250 million euros approximately to build a 50 kilometers four lanes a toll road. And uh, at that time, in the beginning, where they were doing the feasibility studies, they got this concession for 25 years, thinking that uh, few Senegalese uh, people could afford paying one and a half euro uh, traveling 45 kilometer distance. Did you know that the, now the traffic is five-fold than the feasibility uh, figures and the uh, return on investment is four times faster than they have initially planned? So you see they've made an investment, they've taken a risk, but they're having huge returns. Maybe the returns that you have never even imagined in other uh, countries developed countries or advanced economies. So we have to take the risk. Aviation business is growing 7% every year in African continent. The population is 1.3 billion now, will double in 2050. Economy will uh, be multiplied fivefold in 2050. And the demography is there. You know, people are excited to do work, make money, etc. The aviation industry must be very carefully looked at. If you want to travel between Malabo, the capital of Equatorial Guinea, to Libreville, to Gabon, there are two flights per week. If you want to fly the same day, you have to go all the way to Paris to come down uh, the neighboring country. I mean, this is, there is something wrong with this. We have to do more in aviation and uh, that not only helps the uh, traveling of the people, but also traveling of the goods. Today, uh, from Senegal, people are shipping uh, sea products. Lots of boxes of shrimps are uh, being shipped every day from Dakar to Istanbul. That's why the transportation is key, energy is key, and uh, also health sector, I think, is key. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, Mike, I'm going to pass it over you in terms of funding for your projects. Yeah, we're, we're unique in one aspect in that we're the largest public-private partnership in Canada as well. And, and what that means is we have uh, effectively a, a handful of owners that are responsible for all the capital investment. Uh, OMERS, uh, TE Energy, the Power Workers Union, the professional uh, Society of Professionals and our employees own Bruce Power. But in that partnership with the public, we make that investment through ensuring we have good, stable policy over the long term that allows us to place that investment into the, uh, into the uh, province such that we can get a return over time. With, a, with solid and stable policy, we're able to deploy upwards of $13 billion, and then we're also out, able to go out into the bond market and also secure bonding to finance our investments. We see this evolving uh, as we get further into isotopes now, we're going to call it a P4, where the people are involved and that we're partnering with the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation now on isotope production that will also last all the way through 2064. It's a good relationship. It allows private capital to be deployed, not only at our site, but throughout the province. 
It, it enables economic development not only locally, but all throughout the province of Ontario with different manufacturers. And that long-term view, as I said, we start our project in 2016, we finish in 2033, provides a timeline that's, a, that's of enough length and duration that manufacturers can hire new people, train new people, they can make capital investments in machinery and goods and innovation that will not only help us in the near term, but evolve us in, over time into future generations of, of equipment that we can use in our facilities and elsewhere around the world. Thank you. And over to you, Minister Munshi. Please, please uh, give us a view as to, from a government perspective, how you would integrate the public and private markets. Well, uh, you know you said that Bangladesh is the fastest uh, growing economy uh, in the world now. So now our government is very much pro proactive. I mean, they have taken decision, government decision to open up the market, uh, invite the people all over the world to make our economy uh, and investment-wise should be a viable one. So now you have, our government has declared 100 uh, economic zone for, for investment, for investment from the global. And that for that, uh, our power generation is okay now. We have more than uh, 24,000 megawatt now. Our requirement is about 15,000. We have surplus in that. And as I told that the, the biggest river, river Padda River uh, breeze is coming up, which is connecting about 19 districts of uh, another part. So that is going to help us our, in our GDP. And you know, Bangladesh is a country, uh, is the second largest exporter of RMG. That is one sector we are very successful in that. So Bangladesh and besides, you know, we have 170 million people. And out of them, almost 40% are young people, 40, 45%. They are ready to work and very uh, low cost labor is also there. So infrastructure wise, our government is very much proactive. Now we are um, uh, making our um, trans uh, railway metro rail and in the city, you see Dhaka city, capital of Bangladesh, having 17 million people in that city. So that is also going to, uh, we are going to, our government is going to restructure uh, this thing. The infrastructure is coming in a very strong way in Bangladesh. And globally, a lot of uh, companies, a lot of investors are coming to Bangladesh for investment. Uh, yeah, so. Now it's a country for really, uh, for good investment. It's a very good policy over there. And you see, uh, 10 years tax holiday for the investors. And uh, our uh, agricultural product is now quite high. We don't have any uh, shortfall of food and other things. So all the way, Bangladesh is in a position to go ahead and our, our infrastructure also coming in a big way. Thank you very much. Thank you. If we just shift gears a bit and think about the overall drivers of infrastructure needs, that, that it really comes back to technology and more importantly, urbanization. You talk about the growth of population and we're seeing that around the globe. From an urbanization perspective and as we see populations migrate and move into clusters and into cities and into large population fronts, there's significant demands on infrastructure requirements various forms, whether it's transport, whether it's digital, whether it's water, utilities, energy, um, there's a lot of competing forces. Um, and then on top of that, there's also climate change and other uh, external factors that impact infrastructure and the need to develop infrastructure. Um, maybe I'll start with you, Salim. How, how would you prioritize infrastructure needs from how you see it in your, in, in, from a lens of a, of a construction contractor or from someone that's in the private sector participating on building out the infrastructure, where do you see the priorities and how would you allocate the priorities? I'll give you two very interesting examples. One is Senegal, the other one is Rwanda. You know, both countries, they don't have oil and gas, and, uh, but they have strong leadership, which is very important. Uh, in Senegal, uh, 40 kilometers away from Dakar, a new urban development is made. It's called Jamniajo. Jamniajo is a new urban development where the first uh, um, piece of that development was a conference center. 
So in 2014, in 11 months, we designed and built a Jamnia Joe New Conference Center where um, actually the 15th Francophonie Summit took place. And actually uh, among us, Madame Jeanne, the Governor General, ex-Governor General, was actually nominated during that summit for the next uh, general manager of uh, director of Francophonie. After that center was built, that was the pillar and all around it, new infrastructure came. A sports facility, then uh, government buildings, then a hotel, then expo center, etc. And believe it or not, today, uh, Jabniajo is the conference hub of Western Africa. And due to this uh, efficient construction works, uh, they got the 2022 Youth Olympics City of Africa. First time Olympics is coming to Africa because they have done this infrastructure uh, 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 development. And on top of that, 2021st uh, World Water Council, they are picky, they're very picky on choosing the new destinations for their summit. They do the planning five years uh, in advance, will be in Dakar. So this non-oil and gas country became a destination for international conferences. The same is happening in Rwanda. Because of the strong leadership and dedication, President Kagame decided to uh, make this Kigali International Convention Center built, ready, and it's now operating. And every two weeks they are having another event. Now he wants to turn this uh, capital into a sports hub of Africa with a new stadium, new sports facility. They are taking example, uh, some good example, like Singapore, Canada, and they are trying to implement one-stop center in this respect. So infrastructure with the strong leadership, I, can, I think can change big time the destiny of the, those countries. Thank you for those unconventional examples, to be honest, when you're thinking about what an initiative from building a conference center can do to the overall uh, engagement and enlargement of the infrastructure around it in, in terms of lifting awareness of uh, nations and countries to the forefront in terms of then applying specific themes towards exporting and developing the overall awareness of that particular country. Uh, Minister Munshi, I'm going to pass it over to you now. Uh, how, how do you see urbanization and the requirement for prioritizing and planning, and where are your priorities right now as a government? Thank you. Our government has given some uh, policy uh, for Bangladesh, these things, no? So we are mostly, uh, you know, the very thickly populated uh, country we have. And our planning, our government plan is to how to make progress in all this. So especially we are, basically we are agro-based country. But now we have taken, we, look, we looked into the industrial development and other things. As I told, uh, almost four and a half million people working in the ready-made garment sector, where almost three million are women workers. So in the country we are now uh, looking in that said women uh, empowerment also there. And prioritized in the industrial, you see, beside that, we have a country, India and China, besides surrounding us, which is almost 3 billion people. So Bangladesh uh, government and Bangladesh policy is to uh, call investors to come and invest over there. So we have a uh, free export uh, advantage to India and China, and as well European countries. So our main focus to the uh, emphasis on this industry uh, for export oriented. So now we have about $46 billion export. We have a target of $60 billion by the next year, uh, by the year 2021. That is the year of our 50th uh, lib I mean, uh, countries uh, born, I mean, 1971, our country liberated. So we have given all this uh, scope for the investors to come and invest for the industrial development, which can create more employment in Bangladesh. And we are really trying very much to have this 2024, 20, the graduating from the LDC. So you know this is the fastest growing economy and we all invite all over the world 
to come and invest in Bangladesh. We have very liberal policy in the country. So that's the policy we have for these investment and other things. Thank you. And then over to you, Mike. But just before you start, Mike, um, right now I'm very proud to be Canadian, especially as it relates to your discussion around the sterilization process. So every time I put a little Band-Aid on my son, I'm going to be thinking about you and your organization. So, <laughs> so thank you for that. But please, tell us about Bruce Power and how uh, Bruce Power prioritizes its uh, energy development and requirements and its isotope requirements, especially given the population that you're serving. Yeah, thanks. You know, we, when we look at things, we, we want to make sure we're getting the most out of the asset uh, for Ontarians. For example, when we started in 2016 with our renewal program, our plants were rated at 6,300 megawatts. Today, they're sitting roughly at 6,450 megawatts. So we're making more power after three years of investment just by modernizing and using the latest technologies in terms of what we're doing. The CO2-free energy and low-cost affordable energy for Ontarians it helps power our economies and keeps, keeps us growing as a province and keeps us healthy and well. But as we, as we look at our social responsibility, we don't stop there. We're involved in many organizations throughout many communities in terms of outreach. One of our particular focuses over the past two years has been mental health and mental health outreach, especially in rural areas where the opportunities aren't as great as they are in the cities. And, and recently, we're creating something we call the Nuclear Innovation Institute, where we're, we'll be setting up platforms that will help bring uh, advanced education in the rural parts of Ontario. So, for example, like in the small town that I live in, the nearest university level course is a two and a half hour drive unless you can log on and get it online. We want to bring those experiences into rural parts of, of Ontario and have that foster and evolve. Especially in some of the work we're doing on, on the environment and with isotopes. As an example, in the isotope space, when you, when you think about it, our employees save lives every day. They don't know the people that they're touching around the world, but nonetheless, they, they do their job effectively and proactively in that manner. And, and the things that we can create and innovate with the scale that we have, we can make isotopes at such volumes that cancer researchers can now rely on them as tools to treat different conditions. When we open that pathway up, we open up a path of better living, not only to Ontarians and Canadians, but people around the world. And, and we, we view that in the long term as a priority for our company and for our investment programs, and in that we want to continue to provide clean, affordable, reliable power, and at the same time make isotopes uh, in such quantities that can be used to treat people's illnesses. Thank you. I'm going to ask you a question related to your comments on the isotopes and on the powers, and that's related to technology. And how is technology playing a factor in terms of whether it's information, whether it's the delivery of uh, data? Uh, how is it actually um, playing a factor in the business that you're operating today, and how do you think it'll develop over time as well? Yeah, that's a great question. We're we, the way technology is moving and at such a rapid pace, the advancements and implementation in our facilities are enablers to what we're seeking to do. It's helping us to keep our power prices low. It's helping us to get more power out of our existing facilities. It's helping us invent and create new uh, isotope production delivery systems that we couldn't have thought about 20 years ago, 30 years ago. For example, as we do most of our reactor refurbishments, either the disassembly and replacement of new parts, it'll all be done by robots, operated by people sitting in an area outside through cameras. So it's fully automated now, and years ago that would have all been done by hand or by simple tooling. It's similar with the production mechanisms for isotopes, we've been able to use some of the materials that work in our control systems that later, instead of disposing, uh, disposing of that, we now take that, dissolve it, and use it as isotope solutions and send the isotopes off for medical treatments. So technology and technology advancement will continue to play and help us evolve through our operating history. And I think I look forward to those next sets of technologies that enable us to make even more products at our sites. Thank you. Salim, as it relates to technology and the construction projects 
that you've been involved with, you've talked about transportation infrastructure in terms of roadways and whatnot. What we're seeing is, uh, is a convergence of digital infrastructure with transportation. And if you think about autonomous driving, over time, there will be a need for a communication along the roadway with the vehicle. How do you see that developing in your projects that you're executing on? Well, actually, in our part of the world, this technology development doesn't really uh, apply as it does in this part of the world. So we are really uh, not much benefiting from the technological developments uh, in our sector or in the markets that we are working. But certainly uh, in the software applications for the you know, uh, airport operations, we are trying to maximize the uh, profit through those tools and the uh, newly developed programs. So this is the only uh, part that we make use of the technology because on the other side when we do fast track design and build uh, projects we are really not much uh, using uh, advanced technology. Okay, thank you. And then from your perspective, Minister Munshi, uh, in terms of your priorities from a technology perspective, how would you rank or maybe, maybe you could share for some of your priorities from a technology front? Well, you see, now we, we have this digitalized system and we have a plan to make Bangladesh as a digital-based country. And technology is now the uh, criteria for development. We shall have to look into that technology matrix. And besides that, we, uh, we cannot avoid this, uh, this growth in, uh, the, uh, to see the technology side also because we, last year, so we had a uh, GDP growth was 8.13%. This year, we are expecting more than 8.5%. So technology-based, this uh, infrastructure is very much required in our country. And all we are planning that our infrastructure, our all, everything should be towards this uh, development in the industrial production and the economic growth. So all we are looking into that matter from this, this, from this point of view. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. One topic we haven't quite touched upon yet as it relates to infrastructure uh, and the impact of it from an urbanization perspective we've talked about, but it's climate change and how we think about climate change as it relates to how we develop our infrastructure. Salim, are you seeing significant changes or thoughts around climate change as large infrastructure projects that are going to last decades are being constructed and developed today? I'm 50 years old and I can tell you frankly this climate change I started noticing for the last two, three years. And uh, especially, you know, when you don't expect any uh, rain, storm or hurricane, all of a sudden you have, uh, you are facing this uh, situation at an unexpected time. So. Uh, in our capacity, we are not really capable of preventing those uh, events, but we can take measures to pre uh, protect the projects that we are building. We have to take new measures to protect those buildings against those hurricanes, floods, and whatnot. So I, I think that will bring an additional cost from now on to uh, the projects in terms of, you know, those emergency situations. This is the only way, I think, on a micro level, we can protect uh, what we are building. Well, th thank you for that. We've got about a minute, le or less than a minute left, I've been informed, so I'd like to just um, conclude with some remarks, or one particular remark is that we've discussed quite a bit about infrastructure and the next generation, and where the deficits are potentially coming up. Um, one important indicator that I always like to keep in the back of my head and, and share with people is that for every 1% increase in infrastructure spend, there's generally, from a North American perspective, about a 1.7 times economic impact multiplier effect. And I think if you look around the globe on, a, on, a, uh, on broader jurisdictions, you'll probably see, see a similar ratio. So. Obviously, how we allocate infrastructure, how we spend infrastructure has a very significant impact 
to the overall prosperity of the world we live in, but also in terms of then reducing the overall gap of inequality. And I'd just like to leave that statement with the group. I'd like to thank our panelists today for their time and their uh, precious thoughts around these conversations. Thank you very much.